Two years ago, he was a city slicker running a travel business. Now, he lives in rural Japan doing this. You have to go faster because you'll take all day if you do that. The mud is very precious, so just put them into the water like this. In this episode, I meet a 33-year-old Singaporean rice farmer in Japan. It almost feels like the rice has been slightly seasoned when it hasn't. This is just plain rice. Delicious. I'm Ming Tan, and I'm a chef. But in this series, I won't be in the kitchen very much. Instead... You ready? Yes. I'll be spending all of my time on farms. No, no, no! Wrong way! Wrong way! Just collapse and pull. I am about to collapse. These are farms run by Singaporeans. Uh, I'm screwing up so much. I'll be slogging it out as a farmhand to find out what it takes to farm food today. I have arrived in Osaka, but this isn't my final destination. That will be another two hours away. Hello. Hi. Nice to finally meet you. Thank you, thank you. Nice to meet you yeah. too. Let's come along, Nicole. And this is Xianjie, a Singaporean farmer whom I'll be living with for the next week. I am expected to pull my weight as a farm hand. And believe it or not, I'm not the first to volunteer my services for free. There have been 15 others before me who have signed up for a taste of the farm life. People from all over the world, including Singapore. What do you have in store for me in the next coming days? We will be going up a mountain. We will be planting stuff that you probably never planted before, but you have eaten. Let's see if you're up to it. They are headed for my home, Ryujin Mura. The village Sienjie calls home is in Wakayama Prefecture on the key peninsula on Honshu Island. Ryujin Mura is right in the centre of it. This is where he decided to settle down some two years ago to farm rice. Ryu Jin Mura. What does Ryu Jin Mura mean? Ryu Dragon, Jin God, and Mura Village. So the Dragon God Village. Why is this place called the Dragon God Village? Firstly, it rains a lot. The dragons are supposed to control water. The other thing is that we had this monk called Kukai come over from Kyoto about 1,200 years ago. He went to waterfalls and he bathed under them. So after bathing at the waterfall, of course, you're cold. So he went into the onsen and that night he dreamt of the dragon god telling him that he should make the onsen more permanent. So he made the place more permanent and then pilgrims started coming. The name stuck, became Dragon God Village. What is the population of Ryujin Mura? Ryujin has 2,800 people or so. The whole population is spread across 250 square kilometres, which is about one third the size of Singapore. This river flows through the entire village, the Hidakakawa, and it's the lifeblood of the village. It flows through all our fields. This here is Kamigoten, the oldest hot spring in town, and this is the reason why Ryujin exists as a village. A mass communications diploma holder, Xianjie had come to Japan to further his studies. He fell in love with Japan and took up an IT job just to stay in the country. But it was a desk job, it wasn't for me. My colleague there was very interested in travelling, so we decided to set up a tour company in Kyoto together. And then I met a friend called Shu at a tea festival. I like tea, and his tea tasted full of energy. So I wanted to know how the tea was made. He brought me here to the village. We went up to the mountains, we plucked tea together, we bathed in the waterfalls, and I came here four or five times, really liked it. So this is my home right now. Hey, welcome to Ryunohara Hatago. This is the guest house, the main house, and the reading room. Three built properties here. In a clever win-win situation, Xianjie opens up his farm to volunteers interested in experiencing rural life. He lets them live with him for free and in return gets them to volunteer on his farm. Meet Harold. Harold is our current volunteer Hi, here. Hi, Harold. Ah, okay, so we have dinner here. Yes, uh, these bentos we prepared by a friend of mine. She made everything from scratch. Do you miss anything from Singapore in terms of the food? In terms of the food, I do miss um, freshly cooked laksa. And also, uh, because of the cockles, we can't get here the black cockles. 
Well, perhaps this is something I can surprise Sienzie with at the end of my trip. Tea may have brought Sienzie to Ryujin Mura, but this is what made him stay. These are rice fields. Thousands of square meters of them. Right now, at this point, I manage four fields. The people who own the land, they asked if I could plant on their ancestors' land because they're all getting old, 70 plus. Mm. And their children are all working. Japan is the second oldest nation in the world. And in the Hidaka district, where Ryujin Mura sits, the reality is even more stark. 30% of its population is over 65. Many of the residents of Ryujin Mura had their rice fields pass on to them generation to generation. Until Xianxie came along, the aging farmers either soldiered on or left it fallow. But unused rice fields often lose their nutrients, become overgrown with weeds, and within a few years cannot be used as farmland anymore. This would mean centuries old rice crops becoming extinct. This rice has been in the village for 300 years. We'll go in, remove the weeds, and then we'll start planting rice. And so nice right? it's a free like a mud bath. It's like a mud bath, right? Those okay. are weeds, so they, they grow very fast. This has been here for only three days. We just uh, keep plucking like this. I see. Yeah, so we mechanically remove this using our fingers. Yeah, and we want to pull out the roots too, okay? The mud is very precious, so just put them into the water like this. The mud is so precious because it has been fertilized for hundreds of years with human waste collected from the nearby onsens. With modern sanitation in place, the practice ceased. But the soil still retains some of the rich nutrients which Xianxie hopes to maintain by farming naturally. This place is teeming with life. This is because we don't use any herbicides. If you use fertilizers, uh, artificial fertilizers, you create an imbalance in the soil. Once you introduce all those pesticides, the life around the plants dies, and there's not enough living dead matter in the ground to create more soil. Then people are like, okay, let's put in more fertilizer. But once they continue that cycle, then you have more chemicals going in, right? So herbicides have to be introduced to kill off all the weeds, which get stronger and stronger. I spend the next couple of hours weeding. Finally, the field is clear of weeds. It's time to start planting. Over there, that's a commercial variety but of mochi rice. So Harold helped to plant uh, most of it last week. This is the mochi rice. I need you to use your fingers to pluck out about three or four of these. Like this, right? And then we'll stick them into the ground. So these are rice seedlings. We'll plant them next to the interval on the right side like this, and put them about one inch into the ground. Okay. Okay, then you put back the soil like this, and then you go to the next one. We'll get about, fingers crossed, maybe 500 to 700 kilograms this year from all the fields, and maybe about 40 to 50 kilograms will be given to the owners. Uh, I'll have to rest for my cafe, my guests, and also all the volunteers, including you. So basically, whatever he grows is either given away or used up at his cafe. Xianjie doesn't seem to actually sell any of the rice he grows. So what kind of business model is this? Just a little over two years ago, Li Xianjie was running a travel business in Kyoto. Today, he is a rice farmer in Ryujin Mura, a village two hours out from Osaka. It's a massive change that begs the question, how did a city boy learn to grow rice? This is my mentor, the Dr. Esaka, and his wife. He's a dentist. Dr. Esaka still works his own land, but other seniors in the village have asked Xianjie to take over the land, four pieces in all. In return, they get a portion of the harvest enough for their own consumption. In Japan in general, do young people want to learn more about farming? Yeah, no, it's... Hmm. 
So they like to eat, but they don't like to grow the rice. So, so, so. Sounds like uh, Singaporeans also. We like to eat all sorts of food, but we have no idea where it comes from. Mm. This is why we're so interested in Sienzie's journey. What about the environment of Ryujin makes it so good for growing rice? あの、一番は水がいいってことと、それから空気も綺麗ですね。それから温度差が夜と昼の温度差が高いので、あの、美味しい米ができます。Okay. Okay. learned to grow rice by watching his mentor work the land. 私たちは自分たちが食べられたらいいんで、ですけど、私たちがやらないとここの I'm very interested to know how this rice tastes. Hi. Oh, oh, so he said, let's eat the onigiri. She's prepared onigiri. So the grains are separate, are uh, just mildly sticky, very mm. sweet. But it almost feels like the rice has been slightly seasoned when it hasn't. This is just plain rice. Delicious. Another day, another early start. I don't think my body has quite recovered from the weeding and the planting. But this is weeding season. Every day from now till harvest time in October, Sienzie and any volunteers he has at hand will be weeding. But midway through our hard work, we discover trouble afoot. You can see the water levels has gone down uh, considerably. It's not really flowing to the fields anymore. And that's because the pipe leading here probably has been clogged up by sediment. This field needs to be continually flooded to ensure the best growth. We have to unclog the very start. And the start is a spring high up in the nearby mountains. It's a bit dangerous because it's a ravine and we're going on the river to avoid the slopes which have a lot of fallen trees. So we have to be careful. If anything, call 119 and say we're at Yunomata Tunnel and then uh, we'll meet here. It's about a 20-minute hike made to feel much longer because of these. And this and the possibility of falling into this. Certainly not a walk in the park. Hundreds of years ago, locals first built pipes to channel water to the fields below. The bamboo pipes they used were replaced by these modern ones 30 years ago. These flow directly to the field that we have been working on. Now we have to clean this debris out so that the pipe can flow, flow better. When it rains, the debris from the mountain comes down. Every time there's a heavy amount of rain, there's a lot of rain, we have to clear the pipes. There is no other water source. If we don't have mountain spring water, then we'll have to use river water. But river water is not as good as mountain spring water. Look how much more water we have now. It's actually flowing. Yeah, flowing much, much faster, so we can flood both fields instead of just one. After today, I think I'll be glad for just a regular day of weeding tomorrow. We have lots of tough work. I'll give them everything. OK, sure, the goats will be happy to meet you. Goats? What goats? We're about 380 meters above sea level right now. Uh, the air is crisp and refreshing. It's also quite moist and dense. I can smell the life that's around me. Morning. Hey, good morning. The chickens need to be let out. They need to have food. Because they are very lucky chickens. They get Ryujin rice. <laughs> but oh, yeah. all rice. When the rice fields have been weeded, and before the weeds grow again, Sintia works on other aspects of rural life. These are the five chickens. 
I have them because of their poop. Chicken poop is very good for making things grow. These chickens here are Ryujin chickens and there are only 300 of them left in the world. We need to clear out all the poop, so I'll leave you to that. Whoa, look at this big piece of chicken poop. Let me take that out, okay. Okay, fresh tray of chicken <laughs> toppings. All right, what do I do with this now? This goes into the compost heap. It will stay there, ferment for a year, and afterwards you'll go onto the vegetables. Apart from chickens, Sienzie keeps goats as well. The goats are integral to tea growing. Hi, guys. Hello. Okay, they love people to touch them. And when you touch them, oh, don't scratch too much. Oh, no uh, scratch. Do, do it slowly and calmly. Because okay. you want them to be calm goats. What will these goats be used for? Uh, for pooping. Uh. The poop is very good for the soil. The goat dung goes into these tea bushes. The bushes were planted by villagers over a hundred years ago. They mostly grow wild now, and the villagers have been more than happy for Xianjie to pluck all the tea leaves his heart desires. Natural fertilizer aside, the goats play yet another vital role. In this region, lots of people plant tea on slopes because uh, the roots of the tea plant go very deep, about twice as deep as the plant is tall. So that protects the rocky surfaces, so all your walls. And it also means if you want to harvest the tea, you have to climb up very more slopey surfaces. And if you weed them on a slopey surface, it's tough, but goats find it easy. So they're doing a lot of the tea weeding for me. What the goats don't get, human hands must because otherwise the weeds will compete with the tea for nutrients. A tea plant looks like this. They have serrated edges, patterns that are forming with these veins on the back hey. and on the front. So you have to weed whatever that's not tea. It's not super physically tough work, but it's very tedious. Is this all worth it? Well, wait till you taste the tea. It'll be worth all this effort. Shu-san was the person who brought me to Ryujin Mura. Uh, he introduced me to the tea here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I met Shu-san to mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <Crazy. laughs> Crazy, yes! And wild tea. In the sea, there are animals in the sea. There are But I to crazy. Okay. Uh, we had black tea just now, uh, which is picked, wilted, Mm. rolled for a few hours and then dried for a few days. So this had many human hands in it. This one here, white tea, is simply picked and dried until it's very dry uh, in the early April sun. So this means that you can taste nature in this tea much more so than in this tea. It starts off with umami and then it gets floral, oh, yeah. nice, it builds, mm. and then it ends with this gentle sweetness yeah. and just tails off. So mm. much energy in this tea. You smell this tea, this is, you're smelling Ryujin Mura. These old tea mm. plants that we have around the house, the 100-year-old, 200-year-old mm. tea plants, especially the wild ones, so right? Nice. They can brew seven, eight times without losing their flavour. The tea is harvested twice a year, once in May and another time in October. A few kilos from each harvest are sold online to discerning tea drinkers around the world. This is a small amount compared to a commercial tea plantation that can produce up to a thousand kilograms of tea leaves per acre. Is the farming side of it sustainable? The rice, I'm only selling some to some restaurants in Kyoto. Uh, so that raises very, very tiny amount of money. It's like profit of $20, $30. Where are you getting the majority of your revenue? Oh, tours. Tours. I'm going to run nature tours. For the guest house, a friend and I are co-investing. It's really quite expensive to do renovations on a whole house. 
I used up a lot of the savings from Kyoto when I was a tour guide. Most Japanese farmers are also not full-time farmers. They hold a second job, main job. So the same thing here, I'm a tour guide and I do the farming on the site. The farming on the site is very important to me because it helps protect the environment here. And as a nature guide, you have to protect the environment before you can show anyone the environment. Do you miss your actual family back in Singapore? Yeah, so uh, my parents, uh, they come for a few months each year, like twice a year. For the last six months, they've been here for five months. Life here is rural, but not isolated. Sienzie does weekly road trips to Minabe City an hour away for meats. But today, we are going to the local grocery store. And I'm doing some of my own cooking to make Sienzie a surprise home-cooked Singaporean meal. This is Small Town Trust. At this roadside store, everything is unmanned and unsupervised. Take what you need and pay for it. It's all based on an honour system. When I first met Sien Jie, he told me he missed laksa. I can't talk too loud right now because he's outside and he might hear us. I decided to make a dish that reflects the harmony of a Singaporean syncing up with a community here in rural Ryujin. I'm almost ready to serve this meal, and I hope they're going to enjoy it. Put that into the center. Whoa. Laksa. Oh. <laughs> That's what you think. No? <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Amazing. I have been very inspired since meeting Sienzie, as well as Shusan and Hero. I thought very hard about what I wanted to cook. This is a laksa broth. I used the rice that you gave to us, and I burnt the bottom and got it a little bit crispy, so it's a little bit drier. I have some tiger prawns. This is a shokara, some sort of uh, clam. This is like our cockles. Come, let's eat. Thank Take you. Itadakimasu. Mm. Thank you for making this so oishi. Yeah, oishi. Oishi. <laughs> the past few days, I've followed Sienzi around as he goes about his daily life here in Ryujimura. Maybe it's the small town warmth, or the breathtaking beauty of Ryujimura, or the lure of the land and growing things in some small way, because of his love for the people and the place, he's doing his part to help his adopted community treasure the environment and their traditions. I would be lying if I said I didn't feel the pull to come here as well. <laughs> 